about a mile down the, down the shoreline. There's a big cliff and they call it the Amateurish Moin, which is the shooting up place. And in the fall, when the trappers go out, uh, they stop by there the, when they were paddling, take an arrow and shoot it up that cliff. And if the arrow went up and stayed, it was good, good trapping. But if the arrow came back down, it was going to be poor trapping out here. Well, from uh, and talking to the elders and listening to them over the years, the Hudson Bay moved in before the church was built here. And they operated out in a little post out of here and then other smaller trading posts further up where, uh, where the people used to gather. Mid-1840s, I guess it was, a hundred and some odd people were baptized, Anglican, in this area. That was an incredible draw for the missionary society to establish here. And Reverend Hunt came here and established a mission. According to Reverend Hunt's journal, he was looking for a few places to establish a mission. The Church Missionary Society instructed him he had to find some place on the Churchill River. So he eventually went to where Stanley Mission is now, where the church is now. I mean, one, one of the things that is, is uh, key in the sighting of, uh, of a church you know, is that you find a piece of rising ground with the idea that uh, the church with its tower and ideally with a spire is going to be seen for miles around. Stanley Mission, it, 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 it stands out brilliantly. Uh, so uh, the sighting is certainly uh, very advantageous for the, uh, the Anglican mark within the community. And they started working on the church in 1850 and they completed it in 1856. Okay, but uh, and they, and they took them a while because like I say, the, the forest fire that burned down, the, that burned up all the lungs and the toys. The people say that they went, the men went down to get the material in the spring, that they came back late fall. It took them that long to bring them up to Churchill River. And they had to carry everything over the portage. The windows that came from England when the, the capsized on the, on the Montreal River coming down, so they had to reorder those. We, we have here a Gothic building uh, characterized by pointed arches, the use of stained glass that will flood colored light into the interior. And this is an art form that is initiated in France in the 12th century. And so when we get to the 19th century, there is uh, a revival of Gothic, not simply for the, uh, the use of the style because it was aesthetically pleasing, but because it was equated with Christianity. It was a Christian style as opposed to classicism being pagan. And that is such an important background for any Anglican church anywhere in the world. And that is the background that we have here. Key thing, um, a pointed, uh, the use of the pointed arch, 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, that, as we see here, just look around and you see that the windows use pointed arches, the main arcade uses a pointed arch, doorways are pointed as well. Um, we uh, have the use of stained glass, very clearly seen uh, in the major east window there, and we deal there, liturgically speaking, with the most important part of the building. That is the area immediately above the high altar, so in, in many ways, architecturally, we want to emphasize that. So we have the flood of light coming in there, but we see that it's got a tripartite division. Much larger, larger window, it's letting in um, uh, much more light. And uh, if you look at the details on that, you'll see beautifully executed foliage patterns as well. The other absolutely key thing is the steep pitch of the roof with the truthful use of timber. One thing that's very important in, uh, in Gothic Revival buildings is to represent uh, material for what it is. So in other words, wood should appear as wood, uh, stone as stone. There shouldn't be any, uh, one of the favorite words was sham, if it was plastered over and appeared like stone, but was sham, not truthful. 
that was absolutely frowned upon. And so as we look around here, we, we appreciate the simplicity, but we realize immediately that it is a wooden building. It is being truthful. The, the window surrounds, mm -hmm. uh, which are crafted, you know, they're hewn out of a larger piece of wood and you can see the marks in the wood. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what uh, gives it, yeah, places it really in a kind of local context in relation to the First Nations community yes. here. They had to uh, get logs coming down. They float them down the river, I think. And uh, they had to square those logs with, it. I think it was with an ax. There was a frame with, with two uprights, big logs and a log across on both sides, and that's where they put the uh, logs to uh, whip saw them. Yes, the whole thing was done here. The flooring that you see on here are half timbers, half logs. And on the other side, you still have the bark on it. When we did the renovation in 1982 and looked at the timbers, it was actually amazing how, how we did it. My interlock in all the posts, the square timbers, that they built so that they gave they gave a bit in the wind. There, there were a number of unique things about the, the framing of the building that struck me. Uh, the most peculiar one was the use of uh, curved timbers to make some of the arches uh, around the windows. And these were uh, timbers that uh, were found in the walls of the building when the cladding was taken off to do the restoration work. So uh, it made for quite a medieval looking framing structure. They were made here, all the ornamental work that you see. Uh, when talking to the elders, you said, no, the reverend made them here, turned them on his own. He was a woodworker. The pews were built here. Every piece of woodwork that you see was done here. According to history, Reverend Hunt uh, had a great big iron bedstead, and that's what he, that's what he turned into nails. The square nails that you see were mm -hmm. made here from his own bed, iron bedstead. They have to build scaffolds as they build it up because it's quite high. So it is a very, very big task. And one other element that's, that I find particularly intriguing about this building is the proportion uh, of it. Uh, I mean, it strikes me as incredibly monumental. Mm -hmm. uh, it is taller and narrower. It is just this sort of proportion that one will find in exactly contemporary English churches. So the Reverend Hunt, we don't have an exact record of what he brought across in the way of plans or that sort of thing. We do have his diary in um, the National Archives. We know as well uh, that the design of the church was on Hunt's mind before he left England. Uh, it's recorded that uh, he brought with him hinges, nails, latches, locks, stained glass, window frames. So all those essentials are there for the building to, uh, to go ahead. Back to the journal. April 10th, 1854, very important part here. Today I showed Fox and the Indians the plans and elevations I had just completed of the church. So it tells us very precisely that the Reverend Hunt is responsible for the design of the church. I should just say a word or two about the arrangement of the uh, uh, division of the church here. The fact that up at the east end, immediately below, below the east window, we have the altar. The cross is placed on there. You will see that then we have the altar rails. And this is the key thing. That section is elevated uh, above the next section of the sanctuary. Mm -hmm come along through there and it's a step down again into the nave. So looking at it from the point of view of somebody in the congregation, it's one elevation into the sanctuary and another one up to the altar mm -hmm. space. Then as we come into the nave, we have open seating, which we may take for granted now, 
But in fact, this is quite revolutionary at the time. But from the social point of view, of course, it's very, very important that we have open seating. It's free, free for all. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was a, 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 an essential moral aspect that came with the Gothic Revival. Then at the West End, the tower uh, with Belfry and, uh, and Spire. Mm -hmm. One other thing, I, I've just looked around here inside the, the tower, one thing that is uh, quite remarkable and uh, I think it's fair to say cathedral-like again, I, mean, I mentioned that earlier on about the building having these amazingly large uh, monumental proportions, but the height of this window mm. is absolutely incredible. Now in that particular situation we're dealing with a tall, narrow space. So it fits very, very happily. What is remarkable about Stanley Mission is the scale mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of this building, mm -hmm. which, relatively speaking, is absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. So it's very much a matter of building for the future. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a much larger community than was, uh, was expected. Stanley Mission, the, the village of Stanley Mission was unoccupied for most of the year. The, the, the Cree families would come back to it during the summertime. The daily life during the summertime was, was quite interesting. It began with church, began and ended with church. Uh, I think seven o'clock in the morning, everybody was up to go to church. In the summertime, yes, the church was full. In the summertime, because the elders uh, talk about, uh, well, those acorns that you see up there, the church was so full that when they started singing at the top of their voices, those acorns up there would sway. Now they don't because we hardly ever use a church. You can't tell whether they're rusted, etc. or they just, there's just not enough service in the church that they don't sway anymore. And uh, then during the course of the day, it was just doing things to support yourself. They'd go fishing, they'd go visiting, they'd look after their gardens. And uh, sometime in the evening then there'd be evening prayers and uh, if there was uh, something, some reason to celebrate, there'd be dances. Uh, and then in September they'd uh, stock up with their trapping supplies and everybody would head back out to the trap lines for the winter. People would bring in their furs to trade for the stuff that they needed. Flour, baking powder, sugar, the essentials that they needed. Firearms, bullets, traps. Well, when they would go out by canoes in the fall or come back in the spring, it could be anywhere from one to two weeks worth of traveling to get from Stanley Mission to their, uh, to their trap line. Actually, I had a, uh, an uncle who worked with the church. But just before, just before he died, he said, I'm leaving you the church, it's in your hands. And that you look after it, uh, take care of the burials and stuff of that nature. And it just, I mean, this was on his deathbed and it just stuck. So I, I've been doing it now for the last 30 years, looking after it, maintaining it, making sure that uh, when we have a death, that there is some place, some place to bury him. I go and ask the people, well, where do you want the, the grave dug? Well, I'd rather, have, I'd have, like to have it beside so-and-so. And I. Well, I said, well, there's no room there. Can we move it over this way a bit? So I have to try and be diplomatic. This is stuff that we have picked up when, whenever we dig a, a grave, because uh, this used to be an old uh, village site here where people used to live before they moved across to the, to the other side. And we got an awl on an antler here that we picked up, stuff they used to use when they made their birch bark baskets or which work can you and we sort of come up with all sorts of things of that nature when we're digging a grave because of the old the old village before they they moved across to the other side. We used to have cabins and tents, and teepees, but they lived on this side. The, the village was the main location of occupation. There were 20, 20 plus houses there about 1920. By the 1940s, more and more people started moving across to the south side of the river, 
because that was where the reserve was officially established, so the federal government started putting all of the services there. It was more convenient for the people to be on that side because the river here is particularly dangerous in the wintertime. It doesn't freeze over. And by the 1970s, early 1970s, the, the old village was completely abandoned. As an archaeologist, we look at the physical remains that are left in the ground. But that doesn't mean that we ignore historical documents or, or things like the oral tradition um, of the people who lived in that area. All of that becomes incorporated into the whole, the whole study of a, of a community like this and try to recreate and, and uh, bring back to life the, the history of this village that doesn't exist anymore except in, in the ground and in written records and in, and in people's memory. From what I from what I gather, every pretty well all the early ministers learned Cree. And if they didn't, there was a lay person that was around to to translate for them. But, but we are, we have a copy of of a Slavic Bible here, and we also have the big English translation that was donated by the Hudson Bay Company. Well, this is the Cree Slavic version. worn out quite a bit because it's well used. They used them every day, eh? They took them to the trap line with them, they took them wherever they went. A lot of the history, local history, it's not written any place at all. So that we sit and listen to the old timers talking about the hardships they had to go through to get to the community at Christmas time. So Christmas was a big celebration. Yeah. They gather and have their square dances uh, all night long, but um, daylight and go home, and then Sunday they were in the church uh, having their services. After Christmas, they were each up their dogs and they were back out to the trap line. So for a week, two weeks, the uh, community was was roaring, and then it would settle back down to a steady grind. In 1945, then I was stationed at at La Ranch, but I, at the outpost was Stanley Mission. I went there once a month. I traveled by dog team in the wintertime and by canoe in the summer. Until the CCF came into power and then they had a sked plane for all those uh, places up north. So I went by plane. I flew to Stanley, stayed there two or three days, had weddings. And wedding feasts and, and services, and then I would fly the next sked to uh, Pelican Narrows. And so the Indians said, as soon as they were baptized, they were not afraid of the bad spirit coming to destroy them. And so every child had to be baptized. And they also found that the church teaching was pretty well what they were elders the medicine men were teaching, to love one another, to be good to the stranger that comes, and to feed them. When the church first started getting established here, uh, people getting baptized, and we had one old timer that legend has it that he was happy with his three or four wives lived down river. And then out of the blue, they say, one day he showed up at the church and said, I'm willing to give up my wives. Can you baptize me? Many aspects about the front. I mean, the shape, for a start, is octagonal. Uh, a, a shape that's associated, or a number eight, associated uh, with death and baptism back to the early Christian times. The particular details of this uh, are taken from uh, late 12th, 13th century English models where you have the bowl of the font supported on the eight molded shafts. And the placement is interesting as well because again the, the ecclesiologists recommended that it should be close to the entry point of the church, so close to a doorway, symbolic of entry, if you like, official entry into the church, mm. you're baptized as a, as a Christian. The community of Stanley Mission had uh, maintained the building for many years and 
uh, because it was a wooden structure, even the best efforts at maintenance eventually uh, uh, lead to the need for replacement and, and uh, rejuvenation of some of the building materials. And that's the point the building had reached in the 1980s. There was a lot of uh, bird damage done to the, to the altar because the sparrows would come in through the openings. And... The, uh, uh, the building was uh, dismantled, the siding was taken off, the foundation was rebuilt with stone. The heavy timbers were uh, restored because of the, the water leakage had caused uh, wood rot as it does in, in historic buildings. And uh, once the shell was uh, reconstructed, at that point the building was ready for the stained glass work and then ultimately for the steeple to be added. Yeah, to make a stained glass window itself to replace one that's there, um, first, I make a full-size drawing, which is usually done, but not necessarily, by taking a rubbing of the lead lines of the glass. Then those lines would be used to cut the various pieces of glass to the right size. Where there's a change of colour, we would use a different glass, a different colour glass. A number of them were repeating patterns. Uh, there are two main repeating patterns. One was um, just black lines and the other one was black lines and yellow background. The black lines probably were painted freehand but nowadays it doesn't make sense to paint those freehand so my son actually made a um, silk screen and we screened that window which was then fired in a kiln. Yeah the installation was uh, very straightforward. So we put up scaffolding, passed the, wind, the finished window up, placed it into position and fixed it with stops. It's that simple. <laughs> they replaced the steeple to the original, its original uh, look, the way it looked originally. Over the years, the wood structure that was originally there with its Gothic arches and steep uh, roof on the steeple uh, deteriorated to the point that it was actually lowered to eliminate the original uh, fluted uh, Gothic arches. The historic park staff uh, from heritage photographs of the period original to the building's uh, uh, early years uh, scaled the, uh, the Gothic arches, scaled the original roof design and together with their engineering consultant they came up with uh, as close an exact replica of the original as I think was possible. And they reconstructed it in aluminum this time so it would weather particularly because it was so hard to maintain in, in, at the top of the tower. The actual replacement steeple was made in a, uh, a fabricating shop in Regina, Saskatchewan and uh, transported by flatbed truck to Stanley Mission. The way they arranged to get it across the river was by using a helicopter to airlift the steeple in a single piece off of the flatbed truck across the river and uh, to position it on, the, on the, uh, the tower of the church. The helicopter pilot was able to hold the, the steeple stationary while the crew managed to uh, uh, unfasten the, the tower and then safely secure it to the tower. We had a couple of people up there that were guiding it and finally, I think after about an hour, they were finally able to line it up and, and bolt it down. And it took them a while. I'm working with the community at Stanley Mission on a management plan for the church. Uh, the church is a uh, provincial historic site and we're working with the community to protect and, and enhance the church for everyone who comes here. We meet once every, every month in the summertime to see what we can do, what needs to be done here. And they've, they've opened a lot of doors for us in the last couple of years. So that we, more and more people are starting to realize, well, there's something here that needs to be, to be maintained. If we don't look after it, the, the elders start complaining about it. Well, how come, why is such and such not being done? So we, they want to make sure it's maintained. 
In fact, we have quite a few people that have left the community have requested to be brought back and buried here. So we, have, we, do, we do quite a bit of that. We have a lot of uh, outside people coming in to requesting to get married here. Well, look at uh, the history has a lot to do with it, that they want to get, get married here, get buried here. And it's now the oldest wooden structure in Western Canada. So we do get a lot of visitors that stop in canoes, other people that come in just to look at the, and see the church. And there'll be people, people around. Especially in the summertime, if they want to come up, there's always somebody on this side or on the other side that, that'll ferry them across and have a look at it. People can walk in any time they want. The door is never locked. <laughs>